Welcome to Chevalier's Books Online. We are LA's oldest independent bookstore established in 1940. Tonight, we will be discussing a very important and unique book, The Extraordinary Life of His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. It is a beautifully written and illustrated book by Rima Fujita, who is our guest tonight. Um, but here to interview our main star is her dear friend, Dr. Carol McGranahan, who is a professor of anthropology, history, and Tibetan studies at the University of Colorado. She is the author of the book, Arrested Histories, and the editor, The Tibet Reader. She's currently working on a book about storytelling as a way of knowing the world, and we cannot wait to see it come out. Um, and of course, we have our main star, Rima Fujita, Rima has won various awards internationally and has also received special recognition from His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. Her previous books include Wonder Garden, Save the Himalaya, and The Day the Buddha Woke Up. Rima's work has also been presented at the Rubin Museum of Art, Tibet House, Trace Foundation, Minge Museum of Art, among many, many others. And we are, of course, so, so proud to be hosting her today. So without further ado, please give a warm, albeit digital welcome to our two speakers, Dr. Carol McGranahan and Rima Fujita. Ladies, if you would please take it away. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, thank it you. is truly a pleasure and an honor to be here with Rima. Oh, thank you so much, Teresa, for organizing this. Um, and thank you everybody uh, for joining us. I know we have people from London, Tokyo, and um, uh, uh, somewhere uh, in uh, tropical islands also. Um, and thank you, Carol, so much for um, talking with me tonight. I'm so honored to have you and excited. It is my pleasure. I see we have someone from Brazil as well. So welcome to, to everyone who's here. Um, so I am going to first just start by holding up the book. Um, the book has just come out. So I realized that not everyone um, has, has their own copy yet. And you might not have seen it in person. So Rima, what I thought might be nice is for you to start by introducing the book to people and just um, sharing with people what it is this book is about. Perfect. So this book is a picture book about the life of the Dalai Lama. And it's actually not quite a children's book, um, but it's maybe it's um, for from age 10 and up. Um, because um, texts are kind of um, sophisticated and complicated. So um, if you read this to a very, very small child, like age of two or three, uh, they'll probably um, enjoy the drawings more. Uh, <laughs> but um, so it has th 13 chapters, 14 chapter, 13 chapters, I'm sorry, uh, starting with the birth and explains how His Holiness was discovered uh, to be a 14th Dalai Lama and it goes on and on and on. And um, it ends with his wish to the humanity and the world today. And some years ago, I was um, requested by one of his confidants to make this book. So it's not something like I came up with the idea and then I'm gonna make a book of the Dalai Lama. It wasn't like that. I mean, who am I to do that, right? But uh, so I was asked by his confidant and then um, it took me several years, but uh, I, I finally completed it. Yeah, no, it's, it's very exciting. I feel um, like right now is a good time also for us to pause for a second. Um, and share with our audience just who the Dalai Lama is. I'm sure there are some people who are listening, you know, to this conversation who are very familiar, right, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, but there might also be people who are kind of tuning in for the first time to learn about Tibet and to learn about um, the Dalai Lama. And he himself, right, including in your book, describes himself often as just as a simple Buddhist monk, um, which, which is true. And yet the reality, of course, is that he's also more, right, than, than just a Buddhist monk. Um, 
for example, he's not the Buddhist equivalent of the Pope, which is sometimes how people take him to be. But in fact, the Dalai Lama is a Bodhisattva. And a Bodhisattva, right, is someone who has achieved enlightenment and then chosen to come back to earth in human form, right, to help other human beings on the path to enlightenment. And the Dalai Lama is basically is, you know, is both formally, but also very much informally um, in his embodiment, like the embodiment of wisdom and compassion, right, to, to be so selfless, like to devote themselves in that way. Um, so the current Dalai Lama is the 14th, right? Um, since the 17th century, the Dalai Lama lineage, right? So it was starting with the fifth and, and continuing until now have been both the spiritual leaders, but also the political leaders of Tibet. And the current Dalai Lama stepped down from the political role in 2011 and is now more fully embracing the spiritual role of leading Tibetans, but also speaking to the world. And your book is, is not just a book you did about him, but as you just explained, one you really did with him, right, at his invitation. So given that he is such an extraordinary person, human being, but also more than that, I was wondering if you can now talk a little bit about what was it like to, to do this project with him, right, and not just about him, but to embark on this journey of creating a book, um, both with and also about the Dalai Lama. Yes, so it's the biggest honor in my life. I personally think this is the best work I've ever, ever done. I literally put my heart and soul in it. At the same time, I felt I had this sense of huge responsibility because the fact that they asked me means they trust me. So I had to do a good job. So very importantly, I had to be very careful about the facts. Mm -hmm. So um, I read all his books, autobiographies, and I attended so many um, teachings by him over the years. So I collected all these informations and made sure that what I'm going to write is true. And also I requested a, a, an audience um, to speak about this with him. So I had an interview in 2018 at his house in India and the New York Times covered it, the, the whole interview. And um, I, I, I still remember that reading in his autobiography, he kept saying he was so lonely as a child. So I assumed that was true, and I, I still believe it's true. But at the audience interview, I asked him, so you had a very lonely child, and, and I was gonna ask a question, and he said, no, 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 I had a very happy child. <laughs> so it totally threw me off. <laughs> and uh, okay, um, but you know, I thought maybe over the years, I thought maybe, People choose what to remember. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that was my uh, first instinct. Okay, he had a very difficult childhood, very lonely, very unusual compared to normal, well, well normal childhood of most people. But he said, no, 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 I had a very far, uh, happy childhood. So I thought maybe he chose to remember only good things. You know, and then that happened maybe over the years. He's 86 years old. He'll be 86 next week. So, and I thought it was so beautiful that as you age, you, you consciously choose good memories over sad ones. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know if I asked uh, answered your question. It, it's, it doesn't, <laughs> it didn't, it didn't, but that's, that's perfect. Um, <laughs> because that actually takes me to another question I was thinking of, which is that um, the Dalai Lama kind of as a human being, being in his presence, right? Regardless of whether you're sitting with him one-on-one -on -one, as you did, or um, many people sometimes get the chance to be in an audience, right? And hearing him give a lecture or an address, you know, to a group of hundreds, or sometimes just encountering him in the pages of his book. Um, you find actually that he has a sense of humor, right? That, and you can see him moving through different emotions in, in what he's writing about and what he's recalling. 
And, and the idea that he had a lonely childhood, Rima, I know exactly what you're talking about because I teach his autobiography. So I regularly teach a class on the anthropology of Tibet and it's a large lecture class, over 200 students. And we start the class, not with a book written by an anthropologist, but with the Dalai Lama's autobiography. Right. And so that is the text that I use to introduce not just his holiness, right, the Dalai Lama, but also Tibet to the students. And he does tell the story of how when he is a little boy, right, living in the Patala, in the palace, in the monastery, he doesn't have friends his age, right? And you include this in the book, um, that his friends are basically the cooks and the janitors. They're the adult workers there. And, you know, you can tell he was kind of a little boy who sometimes was naughty and who liked to play. Um, and one of the delightful things you do in this book, though, is talk about how his friends, he had these people as friends, but animals were also important to him. And I'm actually going to share one of the paintings now. So the painting I want to share um, first is from page 17. So for everyone who doesn't have the book at home, uh, the image I'm about to hold up here kind of awkwardly to the screen pa paints this exact story. Right, of the fact that His Holiness, even though I, as Rima is saying, he's now remembering things perhaps in a more positive light than he might have experienced them as a child. One of his best friends was this little mouse. If you can see here, let me get the, oops, sorry, awkward. If you can see the mouse there down in the corner and the mouse is at the offering light and this accompanies the story. And then at the end of this chapter, you get the little close up of the mouse. And Rima, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was about this, right? Illustrating the stories that His Holiness shared with you and then choosing to kind of zoom in, right? On some of these details, both putting them in the painting but then pulling them out, right? To kind of highlight on their own. And there is this poignancy, right? To friendship and to loneliness and to memory that you've captured really beautifully in your art. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, when, when I was asked to make this book, I wanted to make this book really different from others. And uh, I've read many books about him, by him, and what I wanted in this book was his emotions. So yeah. I wanted to focus on his emotions, like as a human. I mm -hmm. mean, he's not a normal human being, but uh, I wanted to, to focus on his human side which is very emotional and, and more than mental, but more mm -hmm. emotions. And um, actually I had many questions that I wanted to ask, but uh, those questions were eliminated by the secretary <laughs> <laughs> before my interview. So I didn't get to ask, but uh, I wanted to know if he ever wanted to be like a, a normal person without the responsibility of the Dalai Lama, the huge title. Did you want to ever be a, 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 a normal lay person to have a family and children, you know, things like that. Um, right. I didn't get to ask that, but yeah. um, so, because it's, it's so human. Right. So the, the reason I picked that scene that he, he waited to see the mouse coming down every night because that was his only friend. And the mouse would come down to drink the butter from the butter lamp, right? So, and it's so sad. <laughs> I mean, it's so sad. I mean, it's unbelievably sad. So of course I picked that scene and also um, he had, also, he had a very difficult time in a Kumbun monastery, which he had to stay uh, before he moved to Patala. He was only three years old. And, uh, you know, the, the life in the monastery is very strict. So he was only three years old. He could be naughty, right? It's a normal thing for a three-year-old child. But then they would hit him without no problems. And, um, so he was, I'm, I, I think he was traumatized. That would be the normal thing. And again, his only comfort was this old monk who would take him in and give him dried apricots once in a while. So, and it, again, it's so sad. Um, so I wanted to focus on his, all oh, these emotions, how he, when he left 
Patala when he left Tibet, when he said goodbye to his brothers and because they, they, they show his human side. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, as you were talking, I opened up the book to that exact image you just described. So everyone, this isn't the image that Rima just mentioned of his holiness as a young boy sitting on the lap of an old monk who was very kind to him and would feed him apricots. And let me hold this up now so people can see this one. Um, just a really special image. And I think also captures that it was when he was young right, that these sorts of human connections um, were really meaningful to him. And then you see as he moves through his life and you know, is trained right, and taught to be the Dalai Lama and then comes into that role later in life, that he continues to be actually very interested in human connection, mm -hmm. right, and relationships, mm -hmm. but has a, a, a different style about him. And this might be a nice um, time to kind of transfer or kind of transition to that. So in the book, um, his holiness, I wanted to say, realizes that many of the readers might not be Tibetan and might not be Buddhist, right? So I think when he anticipates who might read this book, he imagines that it could be um, individuals from the Tibetan community, but it might also be people, uh, Rima, like you and me, right? Who are not Tibetan, but are you know, interested in learning about Tibet or our students or our friends. And so he ends the foreword to the book. I wanted to run this by saying, I wrote it down, okay. He explains all right, that Buddhist ideas and practices, right, are something that anyone might be able to use even if you're not a Buddhist, right? You don't need to be a Buddhist to practice compassion or to work to train your mind, right? To think about things like nonviolence or, or just how kindness, right, might be something that you can meditate on. Um, he wishes, right, for readers to practice compassion, he says. But then in the very last paragraph of the book, um, and this isn't any sort of spoiler for anyone who's familiar with the <laughs> Dalai Lama, um, he offers these really beautiful words. And so I wanted to actually read them out loud back to you, kind of Rima, and take you back to that moment when he said these to you. For anyone at home who has the book, I'm gonna be reading from page 44. And so here is, I think, another way, right? We've now talked about his holiness as a child connecting with other people. And here's now his efforts, you know, as a man in his 80s, right? Connecting. He writes, oh, well, Rima and he together write, we human beings are social animals and no one can live without love and compassion. I ask you to cultivate compassion because by doing so, you will be happier. If you wish happiness only for yourself, you will never be happy because everything is interconnected and interdependent. You cannot be happy alone while others are suffering because we are all one. So these are the words, right? That he ends kind of in the book, the telling of his story, which is this invitation in many ways to connection, right? You know, to thinking about the ways that we are connected and while grounded in his you know, very Buddhist perspective is one that he offers as something for anyone, right? To participate in. How do you paint this, right, Rima? <laughs> I mean, um, you know, I am someone who works with words. You are someone who takes the world, right, and words in the world and actions in the world and turns them into art. Um, so can you tell us about taking, you know, these, these lessons um, that you receive, the story you receive from His Holiness, and now turning this into um, right. not just you writing down his words, but you illuminating, right, mm -hmm. his words with art. Right, so normally uh, my style is, um, well, first of all, I, I paint on the black surface. Uh, most people work on white surface, right? But I work uh, from like a contrast reverse color, which is black. And so instead of drawing the lines, I leave the lines, I lay colors, and then the space you leave is the line and which is black. So my technique is sort of like a reverse. And I've been working this way for many, many, many years. And everything I draw or paint comes from my dreams. And it's not like I have a, I have this wonderful dream and then I paint them. It's not like that. I see my finished drawings or paintings in my dream before I actually paint them while I'm awake. So somehow I get this image of my finished work 
before it's created. I don't know how, how it works, but I've always worked that way. And I don't do sketches. Uh, I just, I remember all the visions and then I just, my work is just to manifest those images on the canvas. And on top of that, I don't remember how I work. In other words, I finished the painting. Next day I look at it. I don't remember how I did it. I don't remember the details. I lose sense of time. It's almost like I'm in the trance. Uh, yeah, I think it's the best way to describe how I work. I have to set up a clock sometime, the timer, because I lose sense of time and I go into a nice place. <laughs> so, but for a book like this, um, it has a special purpose, right? I'm making a book. It's not like, okay, I just, I'm drawing this because I had this vision in my dream. It doesn't work that way. So what I do is I write the text first. So uh, after collecting all these informations and then having an uh, interview with the Dalai Lama, I came up with those texts. And for each chapter, I meditate it. So for example, okay, today I'm going to work for chapter one. So I read the text and I go into meditation. And sometimes the visions come, sometimes didn't. So sometimes they appeared in my, my dreams because I'm always thinking about it, right? What should I draw for the chapter one? What should I draw for the chapter one? And eventually I get this vision. So that's how I worked. But the funny thing was, this was not planned. I realized when I got this copy, <laughs> I, was, I was reading it myself and I started with his mother and I ended with his mother. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. And I wasn't conscious of it because I, I got these images through my dreams and meditation. But now I'm looking back and looking at this book I made, I'm glad I, I, it, this happened this way. I started with his mother and ended with his mother because as he said, his mother was the first teacher of compassion. It's an extremely important role in his life. It was the foundation. So um, subconsciously, I, I made it that way. And uh, it was one of those um, happy surprise to myself. Yeah, I love that. Um, I actually wanted, this is one of the photos that I, I photos, one of the, your paintings that I wanted to share was from the very last um, image, which is the, the ending painting of his mother. Mm -hmm. So let me hold this up for everyone. And you can see here, apologies for the glare, an image of, um, this is the Dalai Lama's mother offering bread to a traveler, right? So offering food. And he talks about in the book, how she was always welcoming and always so compassionate. And I've also heard him speak in public about how um, not just that his mother, right, was a model of compassion for him, but that mothers in general, right, are, are an embodiment of compassion. And he's even specifically talked about breastfeeding, mm -hmm. right, and all of the ways that, that mothers nurture children, right, as an example of compassion in the world. So no, those are two of the opening and closing um, paintings are two of my favorite in the book as well. Um, but I want to come now to something you just shared, um, Rima, that I wasn't aware of, which is a little bit more about your process, because listening to you now, I'm actually struck by how aligned um, some of your artistic practice is with Tibetan ideas of knowledge that come through divination. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we think of all the ways there are of knowing the world, right, and for me as an anthropologist and a historian, storytelling, right, is one of them, that stories are, are a way we make and know worlds. Um, for you, clearly, art, right, is, is a way of knowing the world, right, not just creating something, but, but explaining um, and being in the world. And Tibetans have a very specific um, way of knowing the world through divination. And there are multiple types of divination, three of which appear in this book, mm -hmm. right? So this book alone has three types. Um, I'm going to show paintings of two of them just quickly. So the first one um, I'm going to hold up is an image of a monk meditating at, on the shore of a holy lake. 
Um, and if you aren't familiar with the story of the search for the 14th Dalai Lama, they looked, the search party initially looked for signs, right, and symbols. And one of the places where they looked for them was in a sacred lake, an oracle lake. And here is Rima's painting of that. Okay, so you can see that. Um, and so this was a very important part of the process. Later, His Holiness talks about his relationship with the nature oracle. And I believe Tibet um, might still to this day be the only government in the world that has not just cabinet ministers, but has a state oracle, right? Who is actually a part, like a, a very important part of the functioning government. Um, and the oracle is someone who gives you know, prophecies and predictions, um, who divines, right, the future, but also an individual with whom His Holiness the Dalai Lama had a close relationship with. And now let me show the painting that Rima did of the oracle. This one is just for me a very stunning painting, a beautiful one. You can see that. So Rima, I'm not sure if you're prepared to talk about your process in relationship to Tibetan divination, but it's clear, right, in the, that in the conversation you had with His Holiness, that these ways of knowing the world matter deeply, right, to his story. You know, I've been asked this question uh, a lot lately, and I never really thought about it until now. Like, oh, your, your process is very similar to those Tibetan divination or uh, nature and oracle going to a trance. And I'm like, huh, uh, it never really occurred to me really because um, this is not something I try to do. I naturally work this way. And trust me, I'm not, I'm not psychic. I don't have any special ability. Uh, so I don't have any talent in those things. Uh, so please don't get me wrong, but I've always worked this way, how, in a way that I see visions in my dreams and, and I, I just paint them. Uh, but, you know, dreams are a very important um, element in my life and in, in my work. I often get, messages through dreams like for example um in the process of creating this book i had some trouble at the beginning i was trying to pub publish this in japan actually when the confidant told me i said you know what i'm japanese and we don't have many books about his holiness in in japan so let me try to publish this in Japan. And I spent two years trying to negotiate with the top publishers in Japan. Long story short, it didn't work out at the end. I think it was a political reasons. But so I talked to the confidant and they said, okay, you know what? Just do it in America. So, but when I was struggling, um, His Holiness came into my dream one day, one night, and we're talking, laughing and, all of a sudden, he took my hand gently and he smiled at me, but very serious eyes. And he smiled. And from that dream, everything started to work smoothly. It was so strange. And it, I took it as a sign that everything will go smoothly now. And it did. So I often have dreams like that uh, with His Holiness. Sometimes other deities, they come into my dreams and, and give me symbols and signals and messages. Um, and the good thing is I remember them all. So <laughs> I remember every uh, single dream. So, and I am close to Nichiren Oracle. Um, mm -hmm. Netrun Monastery is my main monastery that I feel very uh, deep connection with. And um, so when His Holiness talked about Netrun Oracle in the interview, it was so special to me because His Holiness said when Netrun Oracle in trance said to him, you must leave Tibet tonight. His Holiness said, he saw, he saw those tears coming out from Nichiren Oroko's eyes, like waterfall, he said. It was just so intense. He said he still cannot forget his face. He was so sad. 
and also so caring for his holiness because physically they would never meet again ever so um i think it was a very emotional uh moment for both of them and um so that i didn't know he never talked about that in the book in that detail he just said natural oracle said leave tonight right but he never right. talked about that how emotional the natural oracle was, oracle was so that was very special to me because it's my it's my monastery yeah that's incredibly special. It's also kind of we're back to right relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and I want to also just quickly say, you might not be feel you're talented in, in spiritual endeavors. Um, but it certainly sounds like there is some auspicious right activity and connection, mm -hmm. right that you certainly have, um, you know, to certain people and, and to certain deities, perhaps. Um, but the talent in the art cannot cannot be delayed denied let's let's stay with the idea though of of connection because another story that comes through very strongly um not only in the book um his holiness's word but in your kind of epilogue that you write to the book about things that happened while you were making it which you had just talked about there were obstacles and then it seemed the obstacles cleared mm -hmm. and it appears that um a very important deity um, mm -hmm. It was involved, and this is a, a deity that um, some of our listeners might be familiar with, whose name is Padilamo. And Padilamo is um, both a, one of the most important, if not the most important, protectors of His Holiness, but also of Tibet, right, in, in general. So a really um, a, and a, a, a female deity who is um, pictured and envisioned riding on a horse. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about yes. um, what you learned about Padilamo when you were with His Holiness? Yes. So. This was really, really extraordinary because um, when I was working on this book, a friend of mine in Dharamshala, uh, she's a Geshema. Geshema means PhD in Buddhism uh, uh, as a woman. And she found out that I was working on this book and she wanted to help me. So she said, okay, I sent you a file of Padan Lama's Tanka painting, the actual Tanka that His Holiness carried to flee uh, Tibet with. So it, it's very special, right? So she sent me a file. So I wanted to print it because I wanted to print and put the, 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 uh, the image on my easel so I can look at it every day. So I printed, it was blank, but her surrounding was all there. Paldon Lama, the deity wasn't, was a blank. Everything was around, was there. So I said, oh, okay, there was something wrong with my printer, so let me print again. Same thing happened. I'm like, huh. So I printed something totally different. Everything came up perfectly. And I freaked out. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what does this mean? So I called up my Tibetan friends and explained, oh, you, you never believe what happened. And they're all laughing and they said, Rimala, it's normal. And I said, what do you mean it's normal? And they go, it happens many times. When you take a photo of Paldon Lamo, it's either totally black or totally white. She wouldn't come out. And they, they don't know what it means, but it, it's just the way it is. And I have, it's, so it's not rare. It's not a rare story among the Tibetans. I took it as a sign that she was there. She was so there uh, to protect this book, protect his holiness and all the process, anything to do with him. So um, I felt so blessed after that uh, printout <laughs> incident. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a striking story, um, and clearly, right, um, a, a deity who long right, has been important to the story of, mm -hmm. of the Dalai Lama lineage, right, and, mm -hmm. and to Tibet, um, and probably also part of, I'm opening up now to chapter nine, for those of you at home, oh, sorry, excuse me, chapter 10 and page 32, um, and I think this might be the final image we show before we turn things over for Q&A. Um, but to the image that Rima painted to commemorate um, His Holiness receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989. So first, let me hold this up. Okay, so you can see here is the image. 
And actually this particular image gives you also, I'll hold up for a second, um, a good look at, at, at Rima's style of painting if you aren't familiar with her painting just with its black background. Um, I want to share also, however, I was in Kathmandu when His Holiness received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989. And there was singing and dancing and celebrating and um, praying at the Boda Stupa or Chordin, which is in the eastern part of Kathmandu and a community um, where many Tibetan refugees lived at the time and still do now. And what I want to share is that that day, the day where His Holiness actually received the Nobel Peace Prize, um, was December 10th is commemorated by Tibetans every year, right? So it has become a holiday on the Tibetan calendar. And yet today, what has happened is that Chinese influence in Nepal means that Tibetans in Kathmandu can no longer go to Boda to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Tibetans inside Tibet mm -hmm. also cannot celebrate that date. And also this book would be illegal, right? Yeah. For a Tibetan individual to have inside Tibet in the People's Republic of China, right? Mm -hmm. Having a copy of this book would end up with you being arrested most likely and put in jail or maybe even just being put in jail without arrest. Mm -hmm. um, and what I am telling you this story and kind of bringing a little bit of the contemporary political situation in is to share now in another way and kind of the, a way that brings politics into faith and devotion and religion and just the importance of um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama for the Tibetan people, mm -hmm. right? Um, I guess, could you share with us finally, I guess like as one final thing before we open it up to everyone, um, Given your travels um, in the Tibetan community in exile, given your time with His Holiness, um, your sense of just how important he is, right, to the Tibetan community. Oh, uh, he's he's the pillar of of the Tibetans, right, and not only for Tibetans but for the world. I think he's one of the last living icons of peace today. And um, he is somebody who walks his talk. Uh, I've witnessed myself with my own eyes over and over that what he says matches with what he does. Um, and I've seen with my own eyes how humble he is and he treats everybody so equally. I've seen him talk to the same way even I mean whether you're famous not famous female male old young I mean anything really he treats everybody so equally and it takes a lot of courage to do so when you're a public figure like him do you know what I mean and he always kept his way uh, the way he is, what he believes in, and what he stands for. So I, I, I'm not saying this just because I adore him, but from 20 year observation of what he does, he never really disappointed me with anything. It's, and it's very incredible when you think about it. And uh, I just, uh, I just think he's just so incredible. And um, all he says repeatedly is, "Don't, don't believe me just because I'm a Dalai Lama. Find out yourself and and decide for yourself. Right? Don't worship me because I'm a famous person. I'm just a simple person like you." And that's so inspiration. I mean, it's just, he's just an inspiration yes, for, for I, not just for Tibetans, but I think a lot of people. Yeah, he's truly singular and unique in the world. Mm -hmm. I agree entirely. Um, I can see that we have a number of questions in both the chat and the Q&A. So Teresa, come on. Yes, thanks for joining us. <laughs> All right. Um, so like we mentioned, everyone, we are about to get into audience Q&A. So if you haven't had the chance, you can go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A box or the chat if you prefer. I'm going to start off with one here from Tom in the Q&A box, which says, what was the greatest struggle or hurdle for you, Rima, during the entire creative or publishing process? Great question. Thank you. Um, as I said before, finding the 
the right publisher was hard uh, in Japan. Uh, my first uh, thinking was to publish in Japan. So that was the hardest part. Um, Japan stands politically in a very sensitive situation with, with China. And so therefore things are not as easy as in America. So um, I faced a lot of challenges there. And uh, so I spent two years trying to find a publisher in Tokyo. Uh, I felt like I wasted my time, but now I look back and I think every single moment was a bliss of learning. That's awesome. I wanna also do the flip side of that question is, um, what was the easiest part for you? Is it the painting that's the easiest or the research or the writing of the text? Um, what comes the most naturally to you? You know, it may be hard to believe, but this book was so easy to make. Not in the sense that planning and all that, uh, dealing with the publisher, no. In my creativity, it was the easiest because I didn't, I didn't have to try hard. Everything became so natural. Even the writing, I think I wrote the whole thing within two hours. Um, oh. Yeah, I spent many, many months on research, but when I actually start writing, I think I wrote everything in within two hours. And uh, I, there was no struggle. And again, I really felt like I was not the one who was writing. I remember the moment I was reading, I felt like somebody, somebody was writing through me. I, I felt that, that sense. And uh, I do believe that something was helping me so much because there was no struggle. Same with paintings. I got those images right away and there was no struggle and uh, everything went so smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a question a little earlier, just to sort of piggyback on that last one from Aaron Batista, who is asking, where did the inspiration for the illustrations and maybe in particular, the color palette that you used for this book come from? Of course, you mentioned your dreams already. Yes, so again, each drawing I did for 13 chapters, they came through my dreams and meditations. So um, I just follow, I just painted whatever I saw in my, my visions. So I didn't have to do any planning. It was given to me. That's awesome. Okay, so we've got a question from Lynn who's asking, how old were you, Rima, when you first started painting those visions? I was an only child and I didn't have brothers or sisters to play with. So I was always alone drawing, creating things. I made my first picture book when I was five, four or five, no one told me. I just took pencils and papers and, and staple guns. And then I just made a picture book. I wrote my own stories. I illustrated it. Um, it was very natural to me. And then I, I I, it was not a question. I always knew I was an artist. So ever since I can remember, I was, I was drawing. Awesome. Um, so we've got a question here in the chat from Paul Barsky, who wants to know what was it like to interview His Holiness? I was so nervous. I've, I've seen him. I had seen him uh, many times before like unofficially, um, quickly here and there, hello, how are you? But officially, uh, official audience for one hour, uh, I got really nervous beforehand and uh, I thought I was sick. The doctor came to my hotel in Darmshala. <laughs> he said, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I'm sick, I'm sick. He said, no, we checked everything, you're not sick. So it was all in my mind. I was so nervous. I thought I was sick. But once I'm in his presence, everything becomes so perfect. It's always like that. Once I was uh, an MC, uh, I, I acted as a, an MC for his public talk in Tokyo in front of 6,000 people. I was so nervous. But again, once I'm on the stage with his holiness, 
everything becomes so calm. I, I don't know what it is, but uh, it's, uh, it's a blessing. All right, um, we've got one more question. Oh, another one just popped right in. Um, this one is from Shelly, who's asking, do you have any particular thoughts about how to talk about the Tibetan Oracle and such things without the risk of romanticizing Tibet um, and as a consequence, eclipsing the political cause of Tibet? Maybe even Dr. Carroll, you might get a chime in on this one. I think Dr. Carol Carroll will be a perfect person to answer this. Sure, I'm happy to answer. Um, well, I think one way is to talk about something like divination, right? Or oracles or communicating with the spiritual world or deities is to talk about them as, again, ways of knowing the world that are a, a absolutely equivalent to things like storytelling or art, um, rather than as something that's exotic. There's, as far as anthropologists know, every single human society has found a way to communicate with the deities or with the spirit world, right? As a way of, of knowing and making sense of things. So that is something that's, um, that has been part of human history, even though not all societies practice that or prioritize it right, right now. Um, so I think that's an important thing to acknowledge, but certainly um, stories about religion, right, or focusing on the spiritual, um, for me as an anthropologist and also a historian, needs to also be balanced, right, with the idea that there's a real world um, that everyone lives in, and for Tibetans right now, that real world involves political struggle, right, and suffering, um, and that is in the book as well, you know, as well as um, we've tried to make it at least a part, right, of our conversation here, um, that meditation, um, reading scripture, whatever it is you're doing as part of your practice, even if you're not a Buddhist and you're just working on being a better person, right, that, that those practices, you know, have real world effects, um, hopefully positive ones for you, right, and the world around you and everyone around you, and then scaling that up to, right, the level of a, a country or a society, you know, beyond just the individual. Um, so yes, I think um, to establishing and insisting on the validity, right, of different ways of knowing the world, and then remembering that we're all in a real world that's full of both, you know, sorrows and joys, both. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Carroll. Um, we've got a question from Shamila Khan, who's asking, who, who first says, thank you, Rima, for sharing your special creative process, um, and wants to know uh, how you decided on the composition of the book. How did you reach you know, the point where you knew that this was the conclusion of the book and that you, this is where it was going to end? Great question. Thank you. Um, as I said before, I wrote everything in within two hours. Uh, I think it was less than two hours, and I didn't think, uh, it's the way I work with my paintings too, uh, I don't think about creativity when I'm creating, uh, my, my head is not functioning, <laughs> I don't know how to describe, but I don't like sit and think, mm, what should I write, I don't work that way, so after hours and hours of research, when I actually started to write, I just, something was writing through me. And uh, this something knew exactly how to start and how to stop. So I didn't really plan uh, any words or any editing. Well, the editor at the publisher edited a little bit, but he didn't really change much. He just corrected some words and that was it. So um, something was helping me uh, to start and to finish. Um, I wanted to pitch in with a question that I'm curious about, which is, you know, you have this very um, unorthodox way you mentioned of you start off of a black canvas and you sort of work in reverse almost. Um, when did you sort of settle upon that as that being your signature style? And um, can you talk a little bit about even the artistic process yes. of, of coming to that? Yes, um, I went to Parsons School of Design in New York City. And until my junior year, I was just drawing um, everything I could see, like outdoor world, things that everybody sees. And I was doing all these line drawings and 
I became so good at it. So everything I drew became so perfect looking. And to me, as a Japanese who uh, has so much value in wabi-sabi, which is the aesthetics, the, the beauty and aesthetics in, 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 in the Japanese culture, you know, we, have, we find beauty in imperfection. That's our culture in Japan, right? So everything perfect looked so boring to me. So I said, how can I not draw lines when I draw? And then I came up with this idea of leaving the lines so I don't have to draw lines. And it's not something I, I, I invented it. I mean, people have done it before, but I, I had this, I created this uh, unique style that, uh, um, which became my signature style. And the black surface is, I see it in a way that things already exist, but they're not lit. They're in a the shadow, therefore you don't see them. My work is to put the light on things which already exist. And it just, it gives life to it. That's how I approach my creativity. Um, so working on the black surface uh, works perfect for me perfectly for me did I answer your question oh yeah absolutely okay. and your style. Question was. <laughs> um, I wanted to make sure to ask this too and I'm surprised no one has asked this yet which is um I'm curious if the Dalai Lama his holiness has actually received a copy of the book or maybe saw a rough draft can you tell a little, us a little bit oh about my like goodness. the reaction thank you for this like question that? <laughs> because I still don't know, <laughs> because uh, when the copies were shipped to His Holiness, it was the middle of the pandemics in India. And I kept calling the secretary, did you get it? Did you get it? And it, I still don't know, <laughs> because His Holiness is, is somewhere else right now, and all the secretaries don't go there. So... I don't know if he actually saw the book yet. Uh, I assume so, uh, because the one secretary delivered the books to his palace, but it doesn't mean that he saw it. So I don't know. And uh, this is something I have to find out sometime soon. <laughs> I hope so. And please I know. let us know too. I, yes, but uh, I I assume he has by now, but I don't know. I have to, uh, I asked the secretary three times and then uh, three times they said, uh, we don't know yet, but we did deliver the books. Um, he, they're doing a, a very careful social distancing with his holiness. So only the few like attendants live with him. So uh, the secretaries who are lay people, they don't go there. So uh, the information is very limited, um, but it's okay. It's, it, it's teaching me patience. <laughs> For sure. All right. So um, I do have a question that someone um, emailed to us before the event, which I can get to. If you have any last minute questions right now, please make sure to type them out in the chat and Q&A so we can get to them before we say goodbye, but otherwise, uh, we've got this question from a Nikolai Thompson who's asking, um, Rima, were there any deep lessons you learned during the making of this book, whether personal or professional? Yes, great question. Thank you for both personal and professionally. I learned the fact that you cannot make things alone. Again, it goes back to what His Holiness says, we're all connected, right, Carol? All connected, all interdependent. You cannot make things alone. And especially making a book is a big teamwork, right? This person does this, this person does this, and it's a harmony uh, of creativity. And so that was, really something I really learned um, physically, spiritually, I was protected by and, and supported by so many wonderful people and beings to create this book. So that was the biggest learning. And I was, I'm so grateful that I learned this to appreciate the teamwork. Even as my teacher always says, 
you know, you think you can live alone and not, you know, not to deal with people, but what about breakfast? The bread you eat, somebody has to deliver, somebody has to make the bread, somebody has to deliver it to the store. And, you know, somebody has to grow the wheat. I mean, there's so many people involved to, for you to just uh, to have a slice of bread. Therefore, you have to be grateful for that. You know, you can't live alone. So this was a, a wonderful experience. It was a great reminder of how teamwork is just so important. Agreed. All right, so I think that was the last question of our evening. Um, I do wanna share a comment that Shelly just dropped with us, which is just a thank you um, to Dr. Carol for her brilliant answers to her question. And of course, overall throughout the night, thank you for your expertise. Um, and thank you to Rima for an immersive meditative work on His Holiness. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who joined us from wherever you might be tonight. Thank you to Rima and Dr. Carol for your wisdom um, and your time. Um, before we say goodbye, I once again drop the link to buy a copy of the book. If you don't have your copy yet, make sure to click the link and buy it online. Um, and one last time, thank you ladies, Dr. Carol and Rima. Um, any you. last words for us before we say goodnight to everyone? Carol? Uh, thank you for inviting me, I guess, to be part of this, this conversation. And, and what I do want to say is the fact that this book has come out now um, and that we are one week away from the Dalai Lama's 86th birthday just feels incredibly auspicious and wonderful. Um, so wishing him a very long life um, and wishing all of you um, to get a copy of the book and to enjoy the reading. It's a book that will uh, you can read again and again and find many things to benefit from. So thank you, Rima. And thank you, Teresa, for having us. Thank you so Rima? much. Yes, thank you so much, Carol. And uh, you're one of those amazing people I've met in my life. And uh, it's just, I feel this deep connection with you. And thank you so much for uh, coming out with me today. And uh, it was just awesome. And um, yes, we have to uh, meet in person again sometime soon. Hopefully yeah. soon. Yes, yes. yes. And thank you, thank Teresa, you. Uh, so for organizing this so much and hosting us together and thank you so much for everybody for participating on this event and again this book is a timeless book it's not a time sensitive trendy book which will be forgotten you know next year things like that it's a time it's a kind of book uh, you can read over and over and just to feel good and I just hope that you will enjoy this book when you're down, sad, or just because you want to just re read this book again. But I, I really hope this book will uh, bring you joy and remind you very important essence in about life. And thank you again. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a great evening. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night. Uh, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>